How's everybody doing today? Oh, that was we. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey there, hi there. <laughs> hey there. Uh, I'm Amber Mitchell, Dr uh, Assistant Director of Public Engagement here at the National World War II Museum. To get us started today, just have a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, for those of you in the room, we don't have a mic right now, unfortunately. Uh, AV is on their way, so uh -oh. we will have one shortly. Uh, but a few announcements before we get started. Uh, for those of you in the room, please silence your cell phones. We want to make sure that we show proper respect to our speakers. So please silence or put on vibrate, whatever you'd like to do. Um, upcoming events that are coming down the pipe here at the museum. Uh, tonight, if you are interested in coming back out and enjoying a nice cocktail, we have our Garden to Glass program happening in the American Sector Restaurant. Uh, it is $10 for members, $15 for non-members. Uh, it is a ration-themed uh, cocktail contest with six different distilleries from uh, local distilleries who are competing for the best cocktail around a ration theme. So we have plenty of tickets available still for that. You can register online or you can come show up at the door tonight. Either way, it's going to be a good time. Um, and a drink is always nice to have. What time? That is starts at 6. Starts at 6. Run from 6 to 8 tonight. Um, later on this month, on Saturday, June 29th, we have two events happening. Uh, Kids Canteen, uh, that is our summertime uh, matinee movie showing for kids, uh, is happening at 11 a.m. in Stage Door Canteen. It's free for kids, $7 for adults, so please register for that if you have any young ones who would be interested in seeing, I believe it's bed knobs and Broomsticks on the 29th, so that'll be fun. Um, and then also on the 29th, we have a Flight Plan Jazz Ensemble, which I believe is part of the uh, National, uh, National Air Force Reserve Band. Uh, they will be playing here for free at the museum in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion at 1.30. That does not require any sort of registration, so please come on out for that on Saturday, June 29th at 1.30 p.m. Um, and then lastly, of course, Independence Day is coming up, uh, July 4th, uh, and we're going to have an afternoon concert by the New Orleans Concert Band. Um, as they have in years past, they're going to come out and perform some patriotic songs for us. It's going to be a great time. Uh, that is free and open to the public, no registration required. Um, so that happens at 1 o'clock on the 4th, which I believe is a Thursday this year. So uh, come on out for any, any and all of those events. We're happy to have you. So. Um, Today's presentation is streaming live on Facebook, of course, as always, um, and will be available for viewing in its entirety on the museum's Facebook page, which of course is facebook.com slash museum, and then later on the museum's YouTube channel. So please share with your Facebook friends. For those of you who are joining us live on Facebook now, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, and feel free to offer a question to our speaker in the comments section. And for those in the audience, please hold all your questions to the end so that um, Mr. Bramley can get to it then. So uh, now that my housekeeping is out the way, I'm going to introduce today's speaker, uh, Mr. Edward Brandley. Uh, Ed is the author of six books on New Orleans history, including Krauss, the New Orleans Value Store. And of course, uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know, he's the NOLA history guy on all social media platforms. So follow him. He has some great stuff out there in the ether. So Ed, take it away. Thank you very much. Facebook line because I'm always on Facebook because I have no life. No, anyway. Um, if you can hear me, if you can't hear me in the back, just wave. I'm gonna, you know, I was a high school teacher, I'm good at yelling at people. So I should we should be okay on that. And I'll let Dave yell at me if I can't, if I'm not picking up on the microphone or something. We're gonna deviate one little bit from Amber's recommendations. If you see something in a photo and you have a specific question about it, Please shout out while it's up there, because you know when we get to the back and you're always clicking forward and back and trying to find what what ask it seize the moment on that, please. You know, if you have a comment on something, you know, I want to hear your stories. Believe me, I was a history teacher. I love I want to hear your stories. If you see something that catches your eye, you have a memory or that kind of thing, let's save that for the end. But if you have like you see something on on one of the photos and you're like, what the heck is that? You know, where are you? You know, that kind of thing. Please you know, shout that out as we're going though, because that makes a little more sense. Before we get to the lakefront, just a quick recognition of the uncle I never met, who was in the second ranger battalion and went up Pont du Hoc, got shot in the hedgerows, and then posthumously received the silver star uh, uh, for valor in Germany and died on uh, December 7th, 1944. And my uncle Mike is buried in the uh, Netherlands American Cemetery in Margraten, which I actually finally got to go see about, gosh, 
And I guess it has been 10 years now. That first time I went over there. Let's onward to the onward to the talk. Let's talk about the lakefront and how the lakefront helped win the war. Uh, we'll first talk about the New Orleans lakefront in the 30s and 40s. Higgins uh, had one facility at West End. Higgins kind of anchors the lakefront without doing anything on the lakefront itself. They had uh, a facility at West End and then of course all the stuff on the Industrial Canal. So it's kind of an anchoring there. We'll talk about the hospitals that are on the uh, western side of the lake uh, near West End. <clears throat> then the Coast Guard and their role in uh, with, with the lakefront, Bayou St. John, then uh, Naval Air Base New Orleans, which is what becomes LSUNO, and then becomes my alma mater, uh, uh, Consolidated Volte, <clears throat> basically uh, right there in between the, what are now the main campus and east campus of UNO. Uh, and then we'll talk about the Louisiana Air National Guard. Yeah, kind of missing. It didn't, the whole thing's not broadcast. I had blow, blown up, that's okay. Talk about the Air National Guard, and then we'll talk about the Industrial Canal. This is a map from 1944 that I found in, of all things, a uh, railroad grade crossing survey, big bundle of maps and charts and all kind of stuff uh, out uh, back in uh, at UNO's library. And the this, I it, it, to me, it's when it comes to the war, it was this this grade crossing survey was done in 1944. So this map. At very accurately points out everything that was going on on the lakefront, which you'll notice is no railroads for a railroad now. But, but that was one, well, we'll talk about that because that was one of the deals. So basically starting here at the, uh, well, here's Padre Boulevard and the New Basin Canal. So we'll start here and then talk about the hospitals. There's the Coast Guard. This is Bayou St. John. So that's the Coast Guard there where it says Naval Air Station, of course, that's NAB New Orleans. Uh, it becomes a naval, it, it started as a naval air base and then becomes an air station, you know, you gotta love the Navy. The Camp Pontchartrain was a mystery for me, what the heck that was, but we'll talk about it. Then there's the consolidated plant that was, the, then was the American Standard plant and everything else. That place that says, that, that part that says cantonment area is the, uh, what is now the UNO East Campus. And then over to the uh, Shushan Airport, the, you know, Lakefront Airport and the Industrial Canal. So start the whole idea of how the lakefront became part of the war effort, you actually have to go back to the mid-late 1920s when the Orleans Levy Board starts reclaiming the land out at the lakefront. And everybody's heard the stories, now you can see what actually was involved. Basically what they did was went out a little bit, dammed off the lake, and then pumped the water back out into the lake draining the, uh, the, the, the land. Thank you very much. Oh, well, that's much better. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's like I was, I was telling Dave just a second ago. Uh, about a year ago, I did a talk at the, uh, at the J, at the JCC, and the lady says, you need to use the mic. And I said, yeah, you know, I was doing exactly what I was just doing, right? So, I, you know, I told her, I said, I'm a teacher, I can, yeah, yeah, that's okay. She says, you're going to be the youngest person in the room. Use the mic. <laughs> you know what? She was right. <laughs> and I'm 60. <laughs> so, okay, so this is the idea then, is that the, what the levy board did was they you, you dammed off a section and then pumped the water out. Let that dry out, put some more sand, you know, river sand in it, you know, build it out again, and then move up a little bit more, pump it out. And that's how we end up with uh, the lakefront as we know it. The seawall doesn't come till, this is a 1926 photo. The seawall doesn't come till 1939 because that was a WPA project. Here's the same area in 1941. So that's basically 15 years after the reclamation project began. So that was a Levy Boyd photo. This is a WPA photo at the time. That is Lagarde Hospital, those barracks looking uh, cantonment buildings that you see in the background. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the hospitals as we go because that's part of the deal here. And you can see, well, there you go, you've got Lakeshore Drive. And, uh, and basically that's the, the New Basin Canal. That little building, you see, if you look right above the Jack sign here, this is the Higgins Building we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, well, now that's all what uh, Felix is and the Blue Crab and all, all the restaurants and everything as we go. At this time, the uh, New Basin Canal is still a navigable waterway. They hadn't 
fill, well, I started, you know, well, I started filling in everything after the war. You know how everything that involves any kind of resources or steel, gas, you name it, got put on hold. And that's part of the story here as well, because they filled in all that land in the late 1920s, then the Depression hits, there's no, mar there's no real estate market after the Depression, and then the war hits, and so finally, you've got people where you could probably sell houses, but you don't have the resources to build the houses. So it gets all very, you know, very complicated, but that's what opens up the land. Here's just to give you an illustration. This is the beginning of land reclamation. This is again back to 1926. This is the beginning of land recognition out in Milneyburg. So this is that's the that the, the that uh, piece that, that building the structure you see in the top left is the Milneyburg Lighthouse, the poor Pontchartrain Lighthouse that is still out there at what used to be Pontchartrain Beach and is now the is now the uh, the federal set. Well, actually, we get one side to you and the other side's the uh, the federal uh, facilities, the, the the government facilities. This is, okay, so that's 1926, and you see that the lighthouse is actually still in the water. And then this is 1941, and you start seeing there's the lighthouse over on the left hand, on the right hand side, and that sold Dead Man's Curve on Lakeshore Drive. That's what they, what they used to call it when I was in school. Now, that's the piece that it's, uh, it's blocked off in a parking, you know, uh, just parking picnic area because that curve was just ugly. <laughs> there was just all kind of accidents and you know, people swerving out and falling, you know, literally going into the lake. So they changed that. All right, so let's start. We're gonna go from the west, we're gonna go from west end to the industrial canal. So we're gonna go west to east across the lakefront to talk about what's, what was out there and what was part of the war effort. Um, Higgins did not really, Higgins used the lake, but they didn't use the lakefront is the way to describe it, because there's a number, we'll get to that in a minute, we talk about the body. But um, the big thing here is that, that Higgins, before the war, had a boat shop on the New Basin Canal, which is logical, right? Because you've got Southern Yacht Club out there, you've got anybody that wants to bring a boat and go out to the lakefront. So naturally, they're gonna put an engine repair, supply, kind of all catch-all place. It's not useful for him for anything for what becomes all the big contracts that we know Higgins and the boat, the Higgins boats, and, you know, the LCVPs and the, and the PT boats. But what he uses this facility for th throughout the war is as a training facility. So all of the Navy and Coast Guard guys that were going to be coxswains for those, uh, for those landing craft, plus the PT boat commanders that, you know, the PT boat coxswains that would, that would uh, go out and actually use them, would come here for training. Now that got crazy by 19, you know, late 1943 to 44. So they moved a lot of the training stuff back over, well, maintenance and training. They moved most of the maintenance back over to uh, City Park Avenue to the big facility. Well, of course, because they're building them over there. So the maintenance guys could learn, you know, how the engines and everything else in the factory. Whereas uh, the, the, the coxswains and the, and the boat pilots, basically they could just come out while it's on the canal, right? You could go jump in the, jump in the boat and then go out on the lake and learn how to operate the thing. So that's a little place on, that was a, a place right on, the, uh, right on the New Basin Canal, which is the bottom of this particular photo. And if I look, I think it's that one. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember, it, 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 my, my eyes are, are, are failing me on there, but that's about where that Higgins facility is. So Higgins kind of sort of is there, but like I said, they're, they're, they use the lake but not the lakefront as such. So this is the what is now the uh, east and west lakeshore, or west and east if you go bottom to top, uh, subdivision, lakeshore subdivisions that were you know, the reclaimed and ready to go, but then nobody wanted to build out there because nobody had the money to build out there. So it was so basically by 1940, 1941, uh, this reclaimed land is sitting there and there's nobody to use it. So the Army makes the first uh, move out to the lakefront, and they build out Lagarde, what, is, what becomes Lagarde Hospital in the foreground. And so that was a full-on Army medical facility. Uh, and then if you look in the middle here, this is, that's Canal Boulevard. In the middle, that tree line boulevard, that's Canal Boulevard. Over here, this is Robert E. Lee. Right here, that's the Mount Carmel Convent. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. I have a, I used to have a photo somewhere buried in all my stuff. I have a photo of the Mount Carmel Convent 
from like 1912. And there is a fishing pier that basically goes out the front door of Mount Carmel into the lake. Because none of that land, that land was basically what is Robert E. Lee Boulevard now, was the lake shore. And then all of this reclamation takes place and we kind of get, this is basically the layout we have today, but with houses. So yeah, so that's the idea. So that, that this bottom facility is Lagarde Hospital, the one on the top that is in what would now be the East Lake Shore part is the Navy Hospital. So here's the Guard Hospital now looking the other way. Remember the Tree Line Boulevard? That's Canal Boulevard down here. And then looking, as, of course another aerial view, looking out west, so you can see at the top there, that is the New Mason Canal. Uh, not a lot, there's actually still a bridge over the canal over there. It's pretty much filled, well nowadays it's filled in probably about to the middle. And then that's all the other stuff. There's the Higgins facility. You can see kind of toward the, toward the uh, right-hand side of the slide at the top. The Lagarde Hospital was, was, built, uh, was, was built out in 1941. Uh, it was one of 10 Army hospitals nationwide that, uh, well, for one way or the other, of course, this is 41 before the U.S. enters the war. But they kind of know, they kind of, I mean, the Army's preparing because they kind of see the handwriting on the wall. But also because training and general uh, readiness of the Army was picking up, they needed the hospitals to handle training injuries and that kind of thing. So that basically what, what the, the goal was, was to have 10,000 convalescent beds across the country. So that, you know, it's like, you, 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 you get injured in training, you know, you break, break a limb or something, the, the hospital on the post can handle that. You get something more serious than they wanted convalescent hospitals where you could take a few weeks to recover and that kind of thing. And of course, when you think about it, you know, no better place than the New Orleans lakefront. I mean, come on, you got, you got breeze coming off, you know, you don't have a lot of air conditioning in 41, right? So you gotta put, you know, if you want people to recover, uh, well, the lakefront wasn't a bad place. This is a postcard. This is typical postcards of the early, of the, the first 50 years, you know, up to up till really when color photography is affordable. What a lot of the postcard companies would do would be take a black and white uh, photo and then get an artist to color it in, and then they would sell that. That's why you see all these old photo, uh, the old postcard photos that you see. That's usually the style of how it's done. I don't know who that. I found this for the first time. I'm thinking myself. Who the heck would buy a postcard of an army hospital? But I guess if you probably didn't buy it, you probably just, you know, that's what you wrote home on kind of thing. So, so anyway, so yeah, the, so the hospital was opened in, in April of 1941. The goal was to have 1,000 beds. It grew, the, the facility eventually grew to up to, to have 1,650 beds. You can see it was all just, you know, uh, basically temporary barracksy style buildings. Uh, after the war, this becomes the first VA hospital for New Orleans because it was there. Uh, and then uh, by uh, 1952, the, what, well, I should say the current VA, right? The, 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 the VA hospital that was there from 52 until the new development, which was, what, I guess, about five years ago now, um, you know, was, you know, was moved downtown by Charity Hospital. And so the, this whole area closed down. They demolished all this, and that's when you start seeing residential, you know, that becomes a, a residential subdivision at that point. The real story of Lagarde Hospital is not so, well, I mean, obviously it's a story because, you know, I'm sure anybody who, uh, that, who went through the facility has stories, but the, the big contribution to the war effort of Lagarde Hospital was the activation of the 182nd General Hospital. Now, you say hospital, and most people start thinking a MASH type unit. This was a full-on hospital unit. In other words, what happened was, after Lagarde was opened, this was assigned to be a facility that would ramp up a hospital that you could move to England or France. And that was, that was exactly the idea. So in uh, February of 1943, the Army activates the 182nd General Hospital, and moves and starts moving personnel to New Orleans. Now the hospital, the guard hospital is already there. So you can imagine if anybody works in the medical field, you know, basically you're doubling your staff. 
and you're not increasing your patience, and people are going, hey, this, is, this works for me, <laughs> it cuts back on my overtime. And of course, that was the idea, was that you literally had all the folks that were just there had jobs in New Orleans, but now, in addition to that, you've got an entire hospital that at, at some point, they were all aware that they would just pack up and get on ships and go over to Europe and be part of the support of wherever that would go. So the unit is activated in February of 43 by March, April. There's enough people down here that they, you know, they consider it the unit to be in New Orleans and formed and, and rolling as, as the 182nd. And so uh, a year later, in March of 1944, they break camp. The one, you know, Lagarde stays, of course, right? The hospital staff that were here and all that. And the facility is there, but basically all the people who are designated as part of the 182nd get on a train or get on a bunch of trains, go up to Jersey, and then take ships to the UK, to England at that point. Uh, their permanent, uh, the permanent uh, facility was in Surrey uh, in, the, in England. The purpose, the, the, the mission of these hospitals, these general hospitals, it was, it was possible, they were, they were structured so that if necessary, they could move further to the front. But the 182nd, it was never necessary for them to do so because, well, the, the invasion was quite successful. So uh, basically, if you had, you know, when you had uh, soldiers and sailors that were, uh, that were uh, in, injured to the point where they needed to go to a convalescent facility, you, you knew because somebody was going to spend, you know, uh, weeks if not months recovering in a hospital, of course, they would get them back to England and put them, uh, you know, uh, let them recover at a hospital like the 182nd. The little poster is a, uh, is a gas poster, you know, a poison gas warning poster that was uh, distributed out to the doctors and nurses of the 182nd. It's part, in the, in the notes, by the way, I have, I have a bunch of notes. You know how PowerPoint has the notes section? I have a bunch of notes. I'll I'll put it up on the um, on my on my on my uh, Facebook page and on the website later, so you can kind of see this. But the 182nd, well, the, actually, the Army Medical Corps has really good history documentation, and this is one of the things that they said. Yeah, you know, the, the, basically, I think what they were worried about is the whole thing how doctors and nurses aren't soldiers, and they don't think like soldiers, right? So they did a lot of training, in particular, like with gas and gas masks and everything else. And here's. Uh, this is Lagarde Hospital. This is the 182nd doing gas mask training in the summer of 1943. And you can just imagine a bunch of doctors trying to navigate gas masks and such things. And, uh, and you get the idea. The 182nd wasn't expected to go over to France to cross the English Channel. But they trained to do so because they just so happens that we had a whole bunch of landing craft in New Orleans. So they brought, you know, I mean, the LCVPs are coming. They're coming up the bayou from Higgins. So they brought them over to the new canal and said, you know, basically told all those doctors and nurses, get in and let's go for a ride. And so they would train them on uh, landing craft procedures and landing craft operations. Uh, don't know how many, I can't imagine a hospital in Omaha getting that kind of training, but when you're here, you know how that goes. So that's a whole bunch of doctors that they put life jackets and helmets on and said, come take a ride. After the war, of course, the hospital's still there. Now the 182nd, yeah, the 182nd deploys, they're off so that they are in, they are in the UK. Uh, they, they're ready to go for overlord, so they, they're all gone. But you know, after, so after the war, uh, the hospital is, is still intact, and the VA takes over the facility. So the VA now starts pumping more money into more permanent buildings and more permanent facilities in that area. And that lasts, as we said, till about 52 and coming in from there. This is Naval Hospital New Orleans because, of course, the Army and the Navy are going to have their own facilities. We know how that goes. So uh, this is actually now East Lake Shore, because there's Canal Boulevard again down on the bottom. 
And so that set of buildings that you see there, uh, this would be more or less, so this is Canal Boulevard, so that's going to be this area here, it's a recreational area, it's more or less where the Mardi Gras Fountain is now, and then uh, shelter number two, well actually shelter number one doesn't pop up until then. So yeah, you know, this is kind of that little bit of area between the, uh, basically between the, the uh, Canal Boulevard on the bottom, and then that little waterway you see there, that's the Orleans Canal. Yes, ma'am? The lakefront, is that for cars or streetcars? Uh, the lakefront, uh, the question is, is, is the lakefront for cars or streetcars? And, uh, it was always automobiles. There's never streetcars on the lakefront. Um, actually, well, I take that back, and I'll show you a picture of one, but it's a little further down, down by Spanish Fort. But, um, but this was always bus service at this point. The streetcar ran from West End to the, uh, basically to the end of the canal. And then, uh, and, but that was the only streetcar that actually went out to the lakefront as such. Yes, sir? Elysian Fields was always bus service because it was the train until 1930. It was a punch train railroad. Gentilly on Franklin Avenue had the Gentilly line, but that only went to Drew Street or Drew Avenue and then turned around there. So everything was pretty much, to get to the lakefront, you pretty much had to take the bus. Yes, ma'am. So is the levee there? Oh, there's no levee still Betsy. There's no levee still to like lock the, close the door after the barn. Close the barn after the horse gets out in 1966. Yeah, there's no le there's no levees until Betsy basically blows over the whole thing. The, the seawall was was that about elevation eight or ten nine? That was the levee. Yeah, the seawall was about all there was at this at this point. So high. Yeah, and that well, was yeah relatively speaking, the the land kind of slopes down so that the seawall was a bit of protection. But yeah, Betsy woke up the core you know to to do that. Yeah, can we let's let's hold on on the comments for right now because we, we want to keep going. So okay, so that's so okay. So we've got Canal Boulevard at the bottom. That's the Orleans Canal or Marconi Canal. Depending on if you're a lakefront person, you probably called it the Marconi Canal. And this that's Marconi Boulevard or Marconi Drive rather coming from the park. There's Robert E. Lee and then up through all that empty land where you see a whole bunch of, of cul-de-sacs. That's the Lake Vista subdivision with nothing in it yet. I was joking this morning, there's a historic New Orleans homes group. So I put this picture up in the historic New Orleans homes group and I said, I'm sorry my talk doesn't have any historic New Orleans homes because all those mid-century modern homes ain't there yet. <laughs> but anyway, so so here's Naval, this is Naval Hospital New Orleans. Naval Hospital New Orleans was activated about the same time as Lagarde was because the Navy needed a convalescent facility as well as training and, and readiness ramped up. And of course, well, they, they figured out if the Army had a good location, we could kind of spread out over there as well. Uh, the big thing about, uh, just, like, just like Lagarde activated the Army 182nd General Hospital, the Naval, Naval Hospital New Orleans also had a very big training and ramp up role. And that was for uh, medical facilities at what were called acorns. Now, the, the, in Navy parlance, the, when, they, when the Navy was building out remote bases in the Pacific, big shipyard, ship facilities, the, basically uh, something the size of the Pearl Harbor facility, uh, but going remote, going out to the islands, those were referred to as lions. The smaller, like, dock a couple of destroyers and do maintenance on them, those were referred to as cubs. On the aviation side, big air bases were referred to as oaks, and smaller aviation facilities, smaller air bases, this is remote, this is island hopping stuff, the smaller air bases were referred to as acorns. And what, Navy, what Naval Hospital New Orleans, their mission here was to activate to ramp up the medical facilities for the acorn style small uh, air bases that, that the, yeah, small aviation bases that the, that the Navy was building out in the islands so basically they would you know it, it would be it was kind of a similar process to the 182nd where you'd assemble all the personnel at the hospital make sure they understood their roles and missions 
and then pack them all up and send them to the Pacific. So that's Naval Hospital. So yeah, so you have Lagarde on one side, then Canal Boulevard, then Naval Hospital, New Orleans. After the war, the uh, you know big naval support activity in Algiers had big you know had a hospital. So basically, they took the permanent folks and merged them into NSA in the NSA New Orleans and in Algiers. I just like these pictures. <laughs> I have no. I, I, I have it in the notes. I have to go dig back up because I didn't put it in the PowerPoint. Um, I just found a bunch. You know, digging around for stuff, and I found these lovely, uh, just some lovely photos of Navy folks in City Park. And I said, everything else about this is all heavy duty and hard car. I said, it's about time we kind of take a moment and start realizing that yeah, young people still had some fun when they were on duty. That kind of thing. The story, I can't. I have the names in my notes, and I'll put them into the PowerPoint, so if you download it, you'll see it. But basically, one of the sailors and one of these waves, assuming not the two, not paired together, were brother and sister. And so it's a brother, a sister, and their friends. And so they're walking through City Park, and well, you know, the boats and everything. And it's just some lovely photos that I found that. Well, two things. One, there's just not a lot of color at this point, you know, because color film was expensive. And so it's just, it was nice to see this. Moving on then from, we're kind of moving from the Lakeshore stuff. Yes, sir? Is, is the uh, Naval Hospital what became Auctioner after the war? The na no, they, they moved, well, I'm sure, there, I'm sure there were a lot of docks that became part of the Auctioner pa Partnership because it would be easy for a civilian doctor to actually uh, to work both. So, yeah, but it, no, it wasn't like it became Oxner in that sense, because they still, pretty much any of the Navy personnel went back over to Algiers. Okay, so moving on now. So Lake Vista, here was the part that was the, cul the cul-de-sacs and the empty land, and then, of course, now we have moved to Bayou St. John. And you see the, the agricultural develop the Southern Regional Lab for the USDA was already being built out at that. The big permanent building wasn't there yet. It was still a lot of wooden, you know, development and everything else uh, at the time. And of course, here's Bayou St. John. And the big thing at Bayou St. John was the Coast Guard uh, facility, the Coast Guard base at the time. I mean, hit that yet. So the big Coast Guard facility, now I barely, I'm 60, I barely remember this, because he said, my old man worked at, at UNO, so we would drive, you know, if I went in with him in the mornings, I would, you know, I would go along like Shore Drive. And I remember this big four, five-story wooden barracks -y looking facility that was right there at the old beach by shelter number three. And that thing took such a beating in Betsy. I mean, it's, 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 it remained standing, but I don't know if I'd want to work or live in there. So they eventually tore that down and moved most of the Coast Guard people either back towards the river by the Industrial Canal or to the New Canal Lighthouse, which of course became you know the, the place then. And eventually, uh, the eventually the Coast Guard builds out their bigger new facility that's on the Jefferson Parish side of the canal, the 17th Street Canal, right there in Bucktown. So the, the, at this time, the Coast Guard is incredibly important to the war effort because they provide most of the security for Higgins Industries and these other facilities. Now, the air bases and, uh, and, and the Army facilities, of course, had their own, you know, that they had their own security in the sense that, well, it was an Army post or an, a Navy base. But Higgins, of course, is just basically civilian industry that's doing government contracts. So they're making Navy stuff, but they don't have Navy cops, right? They don't have shore patrol. So the responsibility for that was tasked to the local Coast Guard detachment who worked out of that big base on uh, that big facility on Bayou St. John. Of course, they did their usual search and rescue role, and they, of course, ran the, uh, the lighthouse because the New Canal was still a navigable waterway and all that stuff, so the, the lighthouse was still important to that extent. Here's the streetcar. <laughs> uh, that, the photo on the left is uh, from 1926, and just to give you a, this is two illustrations of the land reclamation at the mouth of Bayou St. John. 
Um, that that photo is uh, that's a, a, a levee board photo where the uh, that was the streetcar line that came. Basically, what happened is it came out of Canal Street, went up Bienville, no, went up Iberville, and then Bienville Street. Eventually, it makes its way to what is the lakefront, which is uh, where at this time that's Robert E. Lee Boulevard. The photo on the on the right is basically from the same physical location as the left. The streetcar is long gone, they ripped all that up, but this, that's a, that street where that car is, is Robert E. Lee Boulevard. And if you look way back in the back, you see the big overpass. Remember the big bridge over Bayou St. John? And it was much larger than the one that was built today because the bayou was also navigable and that's where all the, uh, where all the landing craft and the PT boats needed to pass there to get out into the lake. So that bridge had to be big enough, basically, you didn't want to mess with a drawbridge or something like that. So here's an aerial view of that, basically. This is looking, again, this is looking back from, from Robert E. Lee Boulevard so you can get an idea of the, um, of, of the perspective. Now here's the better aerial view. You can still see how empty Lake Vista is, you know? It's like, geez, you know, just nothing. Because, well, they, they, they started it, and then, uh, well, of course, the WPA did, uh, did out the roads and everything. That was, you know, Depression-era employment. So here's the big, this is that big Coast Guard facility, and then the mouth of Bayou St. John, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the access way that Higgins Industries used to get the boats out into the lake to test it. Well, anything that was done at City Park, I guess is the way to say that. The stuff that was done in the Industrial Canal, they could just come up the Industrial Canal. There was no problem there. Here's Higgins Industries. Couple of shots. Well, the, the, again, I just, this is a farm, set of Farm Security Administration. How the heck the Farm Security Administration is taking pictures of the Coast Guard in New Orleans kind of confounds me to this day. One of these days I'll deep dive that. But that's a, that is a Coast Guardsman on a PT boat on the lakefront, basically. He's just providing security for, uh, you know, for the facility. And then this is, uh, basically I nicked a piece of a Higgins Industries brochure that uh, is kind of neat because it was one page and it shows three different perspectives of the city park facility. Could you go back to the last picture? Sure, this one? Yes, sir. Yeah. Where is that old fort on Bayou St. John? See this clump of trees? I got you. Right there, okay. yeah. The, the fort's a hot mess, you know that. I mean, it was a hot mess when I was a kid going to uh, St. Francis Caprini day camp in the 60s, but now it's just even worse. But yeah, that's, that, that is Fort St. John. Now, to, to get an idea of the reclamation, Fort St. John, at the time of the Battle of New Orleans, was the mouth of the bayou. Because remember, that's where, well, that's where Jackson put, long story short, that's another topic, but it's where Jackson put uh, Lafitte's gunners, was he put them there to make sure that the, that the British didn't try cutting out and come down the bayou. But anyway, so the, yeah, so the, the, the mouth of the bayou was all the way that far back before land reclamation. So here, yeah, again, there's three shots. So this is the Higgins Industries facility on uh, City Park Avenue. Uh, not that far, if you, uh, the middle picture, that's Holt Cemetery. And then Delgado would be right just off frame on the right. Delgado uh, Community College would be right over there. And so this is that area that at one time was the third district cops and now is the junior achievement building and then Delgado has evolved and grown back behind there. And so that whole, that was all, uh, well, before Higgins, it was all uh, uh, undeveloped land that he could go and build out. The reason that Higgins used the lake but didn't use the lakefront is because he needed to be close to railroad stuff. And the idea there, as you can see, you needed to move the boats. And boats don't do well on land, do they? <laughs> so, so basically you would build out a PT boat on City Park Avenue, put it on a flat car, and then they would run those flat cars over to Bayou St. John. Now that wasn't a long haul, but there were railroad tracks there already because of the Bernadotte Street Yard for Southern Railway. Uh, you know the train tracks? You go by the old Bud's Broiler and you cross those train tracks on City Park Avenue? 
Well, just to the right of that was a huge uh, rail yard for the Southern Railway up until the 50s when they closed. They closed most of that down and then became uh, basically developed the neighborhood and subdivided it. So you get the idea there. So well, anyway, so what they did, you build the boat at Higgins right there by the kind of more or less by the old Bud's boiler. I say old, oh, it's going to be something. So the, the building and the building is still there, obviously. So um, basically, put it on, on, on rail cars and then bring them over to the bayou and then drop them in the water. And now you could do sea trials on the LCVPs, and you can see some some LCVPs, uh, some uh, PT boats and some of these bigger, more aggressive PT boats that came later along, and forgive me if I don't know the models on those guys, because they were huge. Uh, so, but you get the idea, and you can see the amount of production there just on you know, a couple of days. They basically ran uh, the boats through about three months of finishing and testing on the bayou, then put them back on the rail cars and sent them off to either coast to be delivered to Europe or to the Pacific. Moving on now, so you're here, we've been Lakeshore, West End, to the Bayou. Now we're crossing the London Avenue Canal, which is down here at the bottom, and we're coming into Naval Air Base New Orleans. So this is, if, you've, uh, if you have if you have been out to UNO, shame on you, no. um, <laughs> even if you did go to Tulane or something. Uh, but uh, this, this is what is now, of course, the University of New Orleans campus. In the middle there is Pontchartrain Beach, and you can see that it was, well, it was a naval air base. And that was its mission, was uh, basically it was primary flight training for what were called aviation cadets, uh, na naval aviation cadets specifically. So of course we start the land reclamation in the 20s, same deal, that land didn't exist until the levee board drained it, just like those photos, uh, that was the idea. Um, and then the WPA steps in with Depression Era stuff and basically reclaim, uh, well, builds out the land. And one of the big things with WPA projects, of course, was, street, was, was streets and roads. So that's essentially what happens here is uh, the WPA, of course, builds the seawall, they build the roads, and then the Navy says, hey, this looks like a great place that we could do some, that we could do some work because if these guys screw up, they can ditch and... Uh, you know, they get the, the, the you kind of swim home in the lake because at that at that point it's probably six, ten feet deep. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna well, you can drown in ten feet more, of course, but you know, you and they, they looked at it says this is a good potential place for training pilots or excuse me, aviators. Uh, so uh, so you get the idea. Here's the map to give you an idea again. Land reclamation, the WPA, the base is activated. You notice everything's activated in '41. And there's two reasons for that. One, most of the WPA improvements start in 1939. So that by the time the Army and the Navy are looking for places to do things, all this open, undeveloped land with paved, brand new paved roads, because the, you know, they were anticipating this becoming just residential subdivisions and everything else, but now you've got all this open space and the Navy's going, hey, yeah, we'll use that. You know, so it kind of worked out in that sense. Uh, so in terms of that's why this stuff developed where it did. The mission of this base, again, was primary, was pri flight. It's basically, uh, they, they were doing, uh, the, most of that's always been done at, uh, at NAS Pensacola, just for years and years and years. Uh, but the war, the, the, the war demand, or the need for aviators, started they get easy to see it coming kind of thing so they start working up different development and training programs for the navy that end up that uh naval air base new orleans later naval air station new orleans becomes a primary flight training facility here's the uh, a ground shot this is the the main hangar and administration stuff uh barracks quarters that kind of thing uh, for that building, is that tall fixture in the middle? Still there. Still there. That's the Homer L. Hit Alumni Center now. It's the smokestack. And yeah, it was built out. It was the incinerator. And believe it or not, it's the one thing they kept. Never could. Probably built, you know, it was cool. So see, the incinerator was all brick. So it's like all the wooden stuff was falling apart. And so they kept, yeah, they kept the smokestack and built the alumni. It's the last piece of the Navy base that's still there. 
So you can see, it basically you paved out the uh, paved out the runways, develop everything up. Later on, of course, as the thing gets used, just like every blessed road in New Orleans, it has to be re-blacktopped. So, of course, here's a, a Navy crew, you know, CB crew coming in and spreading asphalt so that they could continue to use the runway. I just like this one because it's called steampunky. This is the asphalt stuff that they used at the time. You know, now you know you got the you got the big uh, you know big Korean built or Japanese built tractors that lay down asphalt that are pretty much part of the Internet of Things now. But here it's all you know old trucks and steam facilities and everything else. So they build that you know, basically create uh, create the asphalt here and then truck it over to the air, to the airfield. This is the the activation of the base and. Uh, I don't know who the speakers were at the time. I tried to look, but this is one of those photos that's like, I had to get, I had to Photoshop this just to kind of see these guys' faces because it's like, it's like you're, you're recognizing the, the milkman's employee of the month here kind of thing. The, the, the four gentlemen standing are what were called V5 aviation cadets. And the V5 program, there was a V5, a V6, and a V7 program for aviation, naval aviation training. And these guys were the cadets. These were some of the first students. So, of course, naturally, they were trying it out to the, to the dais there to kind of, hey, these are the guys we built this for kind of thing. So, and I, I, I can't, yeah, if anybody, I'm, I'm going to put this stuff up on my page, too. If anybody knows who any of these people are, please tell me. Because, you know, it's like typical Navy photo, you know, activation of facility kind of thing, and then no, no details. You know, my, my, my editor would go crazy if I tried to put this in a book. They'd be like, who are these people? <laughs> this is an interesting picture because it shows three things that are memorable or notable. Of course, here is uh, Naval Air Base New Orleans. There's that big, big hangar and administration facility couple of officers barracks over here and then on another map there was a piece mentioned that was referred to as Camp Pontchartrain and well there it is over on the right in what is now the Lake Oaks subdivision and for the life of me I, what the heck is this so I'm digging around and it turns out that it's army barracks it's army uh, uh, enlisted quarters before they built out the army base on the other side that becomes Camp Leroy Johnson. So this first piece, they figured, well, the Navy's over here, we've got the equipment and everything, they built out the other side as uh, probably mixed housing, it's probably both Navy and Army folks over on that side as well. And then of course up top, well, you know what that was. So, uh, so here's the, this is NAS New Orleans in 1947. The facility was, well, the war was over. The facility was still very much in use as a pry fly uh, training facility up until then. Uh, the Navy moved off the lakefront. Uh, the, 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 people say, well, how come the Navy left the lakefront? One word answer, jets. The neighborhood didn't want the jets. I mean, they could put up, I mean, it's the war, right? You know, you put up. You, you put up with a lot of things for the war effort. Yeah, F-9, F Panther fighters were not part of the deal. <laughs> and so by 52, that's when they go down, that's when they go down to Bell Chase. And that's where NAS, yes sir? They needed more runway. Absolutely. That was used, that runway there was used so they could practice a approaching all the Right, up. well that was all, yeah. That was all the, the trainers and everything at that point. Yeah. That makes sense. So this is uh, basically to give you an idea of where it evolves. This is a shot from 1972 when the facility is still Louisiana State University in New Orleans, which is an incredible story of politics between the city and the state in and of itself. But uh, here's the, uh, the old university center, the performing arts buildings, business building, liberal arts, the education, uh, education, science and engineering. That's the library in the middle when it was still two stories. There's the gym out on Leon C. Simon Boulevard. And right up front, the foreground, is the smokestack. 
And uh, there's, yeah, there's still one building left. My dad's electronic shop started in that building until they built the uh, science building. And then, of course, he had his shop in the physics department there for years and years and years. At the beach, at the beach, at the Pontchartrain beach. You'll have fun, you'll have fun every day of the week. Uh, yeah, the beach was there since 1939. The beach had little to do with the war effort other than morale, because it happened to be there already. Because when the WPA was laying out the seawall in 1939, they said, you know, we could build some recreational stuff here. And Harry Bat comes and says, how about I take what was my amusement park from back by Bayou St. John and reopen it over here? And the WPA is like, well, yeah, we can build some bathhouses. We can make a beach. And they did, right? They trucked in all that, all that uh, 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 sand from you know, the Mississippi Gulf Coast and build out the beach. And, of course, there's the midway. Here's the swimming area a little further out. No doubt some sailors and army guys there. Uh, the Zephyr uh, opened in uh, summer of 1939. Pretty much, the, you know, he had, you know, Bat had this all planned out. He was an amusement park guy because he had already had Pond Strait Beach by Bayou St. John. So they uh, acquired, they, they bought the Zephyr, built everything out. This gorgeous Art Deco station. I swear it was. Looks like, looked like an old, old streamliner train. Just wonderful, right? This is an ad from the Picayune back in, at that time. And then, of course, now, this is 1941, and you've got WPA contractors and Navy contractors surveying the area because you're looking for landing spots and, and how to place those runways. <coughs> and that's the beach. Uh, separate but equal, well, it was separate, but it sure as heck wasn't equal at Lincoln Beach at the time. Uh, the Pine Strait Beach had those, you know, WPA built really nice uh, bathhouses, changing facilities and everything, and then a big ramp over the, mid, uh, over the midway out to the beach. This was Lincoln Beach out in, uh, in, uh, the, in Little Woods for African Americans. It eventually built out better than this after the war, but this was their idea of separate but equal in 1949. Moving on now. So we're past the London Avenue Canal. There's the beach. There's the Naval Air Station. This is 19, late 1942, early 1943. You'll notice that Camp Pontchartrain is gone because they fleshed out the other side of Franklin Avenue as an army base. So that, that temporary area, they needed more space for all of the, whatever, you know, the different operations that were going on. And in the middle, Consolidated Aircraft, who then merges with Voltee Aircraft to become Consolidated Voltee, and then after the war becomes Convair, is the name of, of the company, builds out a facility for building, you know, an aircraft facility. And the big thing that was built out there, of course, were the PBY Catalinas, the flying boats. And uh, so basically, it's a classic automobile-style assembly line, where you start out here, and you end up over toward the lake, and then they can push the plane out into the, off a ramp, and of course it's a flying boat, so just push it out in, take off, and then land back at the naval base, and then put the, uh, well basically fly, fly the plane someplace where you can put them on a rail car and take them to either coast to deliver them. Consolidated uh, made about, did I put the number? Yeah, 235, thank you Winston for that number. <laughs> With Winston Hogan, I, I, I nicked that from your site because I didn't know how many it was easy, I didn't have to go dig it. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the PBY Catalinas uh, started, uh, they, they started development, the, the, the company had been building them out since the 30s because they were great, they were great multi-purpose boats, they were, they were flying boats. They, they were used, you know, used for search and rescue, they were used for observation and scouting, and uh, actually the Russians and the, uh, and the British actually used them as bombers. They weren't the greatest at that, but they were slow, and you saw something you didn't like, you could drop something, basically, <laughs> was the idea. So, so that's the consolidated, multi, the consolidated aircraft plant. Um, it opened in '43. They were building the uh, they were building the PBYs out in San Diego at the time. And what happened was, uh, in addition to the PBYs, the uh, consolidated Volte other big product was the B-24 Liberator bomber. 
And um, well, those to say, let's just say those had a bigger, a bigger casualty count than the PBYs. So that the company needed to escalate the production of B-24s for basically to, to be bombers. And so uh, basically what happened was they needed to open up another assembly line for the PBYs and they chose New Orleans for a number of different reasons. But 235 flying boats were built here. They were all set, Convair wanted to stay. They were all set to, uh, to develop other products that could be manufactured at that facility. But, uh, well, uh, the contracts, all, uh, you know, after the war, all the contracts be canceled, nobody wants to pay for anything, that kind of thing. So uh, Consolidated closes down and leaves New Orleans, but a couple, but in 48, the, uh, well, the, the manufacturing plant is still there, and so uh, American Standard, the plumbing company, takes over the facility in 48, and they're there till 1985, which, which was that just, I don't know if anybody was around to, to feel that fire. <laughs> but uh, my, my in-laws lived in Lake Oaks, and boy, that was a scary thing, because it's just, you know, it's like, like going out to the, to the Norco refinery, you know, when they're burning product or something. Just, you're like, how the heck is this going to last? You know, how, you know, how is this not going to spread kind of thing? So it burned to the ground. Now, of course, it's the uh, uh, Living Brook Field Yard. But for, for 48 to 85, it was still used and still provide a lot of jobs to the, to the area. There's a P, this is a PBY-6. This is one of the later planes that was built at Consolidated. Well, I don't know if that particular one was built in New Orleans, but that's a typical PBY. If you remember the movie Midway from 1976, that's my, really my personal, because I was in high school at the time, that was my big memory of PBYs because they had all those scenes where you had the guys searching for the Japanese carriers, and they were in Catalinas doing that. And then they show the uh, pictures of picking up pilots and everything else. I could not find a picture of the man better than this, and I, I apologize I didn't call you and ask you, Mr. Ho, but <laughs> this is a, a couple of personal stories that come out of, uh, of Consolidated that I wanted to, to mention a little bit. You know, we always talk, people talk about the personal stories with Higgins, and we have the new, the, the new exhibit here and everything else. So I was looking for a different angle for this. And so one of the things, of course, is a gentleman that's named Edward Choi. He's a native of Shantou in uh, Guangdong province of China. And what happened was is that because of Pearl Harbor, he basically, he, he was up in Michigan, right? Was, he got his degree? Yeah, he got his degree in Michigan. And then so he moves down, and he's, he takes a job in Baton Rouge. He wants to get back to China, okay? But Pearl Harbor, he's, now he's basically stuck and can't get back because a combination of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese actually taking over a big chunk of China, and now you can't get a ship back to China at this point from the U.S. because of the war. So he's pretty much stuck here. So he starts as a draftsman uh, and, 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 uh, in living in Baton Rouge, and then Consolidated opens in New Orleans, and Mr. Choi takes a job at Consolidated Voltee out on Franklin Avenue, out at the lakefront. And uh, basically he goes out there, and he's a draftsman and an engineer, and you know, a, a, a mid-man, I don't say management, but a professional level as opposed to working the assembly line. So he does that uh, through the war, of course, he gets laid off with everybody else when uh, Volte closes down, and then he uh, opens up, basically, he hangs out his shingle as an architect and starts designing homes, designing commercial buildings, that kind of thing. Uh, Mr. Choi's big claim to fame, in addition to a couple of churches in Mid-City, is the Schweigmans on Bienville that is now the uh, Whole Foods. But if we look at it, it's pretty much they use... Yes, sir, can please help me. <laughs> Basically what it is is that Troy, I think what it is is that he just outbid everyone because Troy built, apparently designed all of the Shrekman in the 1960s and there were actually three of these that have the parking lot on top, the one that was just demolished on, uh, on the uh, Lower Garden Street. That was another one that he built. He actually had three of them. This is the only one that's left. So that has the parking lot on top, yeah. yeah. Well, the only one that I can confirm the that, that, I, I Wait, exactly how many the Lowe's on Veterans is this design and has an upper parking lot. Well, that's what I thought it was, too. 
Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So well, that, that, that's with, by the way, for uh, so, uh, so Dave doesn't yell at me about repeating the question. Uh, that's, that's Mr. Winston Ho from UNO who uh, has researched the Chinese in New Orleans extensively. And, uh, and Troy, obviously, is one of the... He's, I, I've got a reference in the notes to, to his article on Troy. But yeah, that was one of the things. Is that, yeah, you know, when, you're, when you work for yourself, I, you, I guess you can lowball a contract. And, and of course, that's, he's, he's standing next to this. Is, again, I apologize for the quality of this. This is one of those microfish kind of things. This is Edward Troy, and that's, of course, John Schwegman. And so that's the opening of that store. But anyway, yeah, so he's... Basically, Troy gets stuck in the United States decides to make the best of it in New Orleans, works for Consolidated, building the PBYs, and eventually goes from there. Another little story was a gentleman called, named Charles Carroll Lloyd who comes down from uh, uh, Massachusetts via, uh, via Nebraska. He comes down, uh, he was out in San Diego, transfers to New Orleans, and be, uh, goes to work at Consolidated Vaulty. Uh, after he marries a New Orleans lady named Mary Pfister, they move back out to San Diego, and he becomes literally a rocket scientist because they move up to uh, they move up to the Bay Area. He goes to work at Jet Propulsion. His daughter wrote a an interesting profile of a comparison of JPL in the '60s and JPL now. Uh, she's a writer, and so you know, she didn't, so that, that's kind of you know an interesting story as it goes from there. This is a photo of a gentleman who worked the first, who built the first PBY in San Diego and were still there for the last PBY in 1945. And that's the last PBY built at Consolidated Vaulty in New Orleans. Last little piece, and we're gonna, I'm going to move through this because they're telling me I'm getting behind here, but that's okay. Um, so basically, we move from consolidated over to the what's, where you see there's this cantonment area. That becomes an army base. And there's a couple of other maps that I've looked at and that refer to this and said it's a bomber base. And I'm like, a what? You know, because I'm like, there was no runway. There, there were no runways. What is you know on what is the East Campus now? You know, it's kind of hello. But of course, there was the airport on the other side of the industrial canal. So yeah, there were some runways. But bombers? Never, never got it. What it was was the 122nd Observation Squadron, which eventually becomes the 122nd Fighter Squadron of the Louisiana Air National Guard that's still in existence today. But back in the late 30s, going into the 40s, the squadron was what was called an Observation Squadron. And they were detailed to New Orleans and attached here in, uh, in 1940, 1941, for, of all things, anti-submarine warfare. They would fly out of Shushan Airport, go down to the Gulf, and if they saw a sub, they would shoot it. And, well, that's the old diesel boats that spent a lot of time on the surface, so it was actually possible at that point. So here's, the, here's camp, what, is, what becomes... Uh, Leroy Johnson, by the way, is a, was a soldier from North Louisiana who uh, received the uh, Medal of Honor, and so the base was named after him. All this time, it's the air base, you know, it's, it's the Army post, that kind of thing. This little piece in the middle is a stockade for prisoner of war. It's right about where the Pope's altar was. There's Consolidated and the beach, and then all of this is... Supply, well, it originally starts as uh, as support for the 122nd, and then uh, just becomes a big supply depot as well. This is what stuck me. I had to go digging around for this. I said, "What kind of planes? There were the bombers out there, right?" Well, it wasn't bombers. It was these old uh, it was these old strafing planes called an O47. It's just slow flight, low you know, low speed uh, observation planes. And then if they saw something, they had like four machine guns on the thing. They could just go shoot it. So it was a three-man crew. It was a pilot, a co-pilot, a, a pilot, a navigator, observer, guy with binoculars, and then a gunner. So the base becomes basically the west side of the bay is, is what becomes Camp Leroy Johnson. The east side, of course, the, uh, the Army, and then well, through the Louisiana National Guard, Commandeers, quote, leases the airport, and it becomes a military facility during the war. Afterwards, of course, but before and after, it was Lakefront Airport. 
The WPA built out all those nice hangars that you still see out there for the squadron. This, I just love the shot because it's so like noir, you know. It's, so they put all the outdoor, WPA built out all the outdoor lighting in the place that you could do night landings and everything else. And there's an old uh, uh, C-47, well, DC-3. I guess it's a C-47 at the time. So uh, out there at Shushan. You know the, 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 the Seabrook Bridge? And then there's the railroad bridge next to it. Well, here's a good picture of the railroad bridge without the Seabrook Bridge because it hasn't been built yet. And of course, you could drive. There was a there's 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 actually auto lanes on either side of the train tracks on the bridge. These uh, in those days, they, it was down more than up so that the traffic between the airport and the base could be you know linked together. Now, of course, that bridge is up more than down because the Seabrook Bridge they basically just keep it up so that the uh, shipping traffic can go through the industrial canal, and then when the train comes, they put it down. More security on the industrial canal. Yeah, they like this guy. You know, it's like I wish I knew who he was. You know, if anybody knows, you know, let me know. You know, and here's workers at Higgins. Higgins again. We said we started with Higgins. We kind of end with Higgins. Here's all the guys taking a lunch break, and there's the Cloverland dairy truck coming because they would they would drink milk with lunch back in the day, and uh, so that's the Higgins facility on the industrial canal. Um, this is a a little bit of a dedication ceremony with uh, some completed PT boats and then have a little, uh, little press ceremony and everything to say Higgins is doing really, really well, which of course they were. And so this is out on the Industrial Canal. So we've come from the New Basin Canal to the Industrial Canal uh, going over. That's me. Uh, just remember NOLA History Guy. If you have any, ever have any questions, but, and boy, if you can add to this story, please, you know, ping me because it's like, that's 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 me. I'm buying my books too. But you know, that's another story. Uh, if I may be permitted a proud dad moment, that is my firstborn, who is a uh, an O3 submariner, and he got his master's in military history at the Army Command and General Staff College on Friday. So I'm pretty much a big blushing dad at the moment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he's a yeah he's a submariner. He went to Brother Martin. Uh, went to, uh, got his degree in nuclear engineering at Georgia Tech, and well, now he's got a master's in military history, which is, wow. makes me very proud. So, how are we doing? Questions now, please. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how big was that facility where they had the prisoners? Where they had, oh, where they had the prisoners? The question is, how big was the facility? It, it looks like it's only about six barracks buildings. So I can't imagine they had more than 50 Germans there. Yes, sir. Interesting story. I don't know if you remember Dr. Frank Mignard? Yeah. When he was, uh, he was uh, tall and he had a, a, a crew cut, he and one of his pals went out for the lake one, one night, and uh, some uh, policemen came and arrested him. They said, hey, you're a German. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's the German. I, I love it, yeah. That was the one thing. Is just anybody who's looked at those photos in, in, in recent years, Wonders, how the heck did you have German POW is that close to the Catalina manufacturing plant? And they're kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, but whatever, they were happy. They thought of that. My father was too old to go into the law and graduated from the Italian Naval Academy and spoke about six languages. And he was employed by the, um, not employed, but he volunteered. But he worked with the prisoners that were out there Ah. And determine which ones were true Nazis and which ones were. Because he spoke fluent German and French. And gotcha. Yeah, so. And so the ones they worked it out. Yeah. They worked it out. And the guys that that were safe and, and yeah. whatever, they caught the Canal Boulevard bus and went to work to replace men who were off the war. Yeah. Who were gone to war. That makes sense. And the, uh, the, the pure boys, <coughs> they were put under lock and key with big bars. So gotcha. We'll come, we'll come back in 20 years and bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that, that, that does not surprise me in the least. Yeah. As my, my father liked not only the aspect of helping the American effort, but also in, in ministering unto the kids who were just 17 years old and away from Makes sense. Yeah. German prisoners. You bet. And uh, a lot of those. Sure, written it down, but I would say there were more than one of them. That's some dear young lady. Oh, yeah, that's the stories. Yeah, and, uh, 
1947, yeah. he came back as a mm -hmm. tourist. And, uh, That's the story. It's like from, from Scotland is where do you get all these Italian surnames, and it was Italian POWs that were... Where it, yeah, it doesn't surprise me and say, well, we always had a big German, you know, we always had a big German community in New Orleans, so that doesn't, yeah. none of that surprises me in the yeah. least. Like this, doing other, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions, comments? Are we good? Thanks so much for coming out. This was fun.